for, for coming along. Uh, late yesterday, uh, out of courtesy, Australian officials in Canberra, Beijing and at the World Trade Organisation in Geneva uh, advised their Chinese counterparts of Australia's intention uh, to request formal consultations with China in relation to the application of anti-dumping and countervailing duties uh, against the Australian barley industry. Uh, we will make those formal requests through the WTO tonight. Uh, we've applied uh, at every step of this journey all of the appropriate processes, procedures and courtesies to the manner in which Australia and Australian industries have engaged with the Chinese government uh, and their Chinese counterparts. Uh, this is the logical and appropriate next step for Australia to take. We have uh, been a long-standing defender of the international rules-based system, of the importance of multilateral cooperation and engagement. And in doing so, it's appropriate uh, that when we argue for there to be international rules and an independent international umpire to resolve disputes, that when we find ourselves in the case of having such disputes, we call in the umpire and we ask the independent umpire to adjudicate and ultimately to help to settle those disputes. This is not the first time even in my stint as Australia's Trade Minister, that we've taken such action. Uh, Australia has a current dispute with India in relation to the sugar industry. We have had a dispute with Canada in relation to the wine industry, which importantly, we have ultimately resolved without having to use all of the WTO processes. So in initiating this dispute with China in relation to the barley industry, we again extend the important offer of dialogue and discussion as an off-road, an off-ramp in relation to this dispute. We've done it with Canada in relation to wine. We can do it with China in relation to Bali if both parties are willing to come to the table and sit down and work through the relevant issues in that regard. WTO dispute resolution processes are not perfect. Uh, they take longer than would be ideal, but ultimately it is the right avenue for Australia to take at this point in time. We, along with many other countries, use these processes in the right and orderly way, uh, and Australian industry should see this as being about Australia defending the values, operation and interests of Australian producers, but doing so in a calm, methodical and careful manner. We've taken this step following extensive consultation with Australian industry, and I thank them for their engagement uh, throughout uh, recent months, and indeed in relation to the grains industry and the barley sector in particular, for their cooperation over the preceding couple of years since China first initiated investigations into this sector, and as we have sought to work with them in their defence at every step of the way. We are highly confident that based on the evidence, data and analysis we have put Together already, Australia has an incredibly strong case to mount in relation to defending the integrity and propriety of our grain growers and barley producers. We have full confidence uh, that they are not unduly subsidised, that they do not dump their product into global markets and that they have operated with nothing but commercial imperatives in relation to the way they have engaged in the China market, providing their Chinese customers over a, over a sustained period of time with a high quality, value for money, market oriented proposition in relation to Australian barley. And those are exactly the factors underpinned by evidence that we will take through the WTO processes in relation to defending the integrity of our farmers and grain growers and making sure that their rights uh, are upheld uh, through the global trading system. Minister, uh, overnight the Chinese Foreign Ministry pointed to two specific deals that it had issue with. One was the Seagate takeover bid for Australian gas pipelines, and the other was the Lion Menu dairy deal. Neither of those deals were uh, recommended to be blocked by the Foreign Investment Review Board on national security provisions. Has Australia left itself vulnerable by blocking business deals for Chinese takeovers without further backing? Well, Australia's, uh, Australia's foreign investment laws have always operated on the basis that the Treasurer of the day makes a final decision in relation to 
whether or not an investment is in Australia's national interest. Uh, and this is an important safeguard to ensure that ultimately not only do we have that national interest test, but public confidence uh, of foreign investment into Australia is maintained. And so those processes, underpinned by FERB analysis, but ultimately a judgment for the Treasurer of the day, need to consider all aspects around Australia's national interest, take that advice from FERB, overlay it with other advice and analysis, and ultimately come to a judgment call. Uh, Australia remains very much one of the world's most open economies when it comes to welcoming foreign investment. The vast majority of applications that are received for foreign investment are approved. And over the last 12 months, the vast majority of applications have been approved, including the vast majority of applications from uh, Chinese applicants through the FERB process too. Minister, how long would the WTO process take and what's the worst thing that could happen in China if it found in Australia's favour? So the WTO, the WTO processes, as I acknowledged in my remarks, uh, take longer than we would, uh, would wish to be the case in an ideal world. It could take years. It could take years. Um, so this is about achieving, as much as anything, a systemic outcome as well as a specific outcome. We want a specific outcome that recognises Australia's grain growers and barley industry operate in nothing other than entirely commercial ways and with the utmost of integrity. But we also want a systemic outcome uh, that identifies the fact that the decisions that have been reached by Chinese authorities lack basis, are not underpinned by facts and evidence, uh, and ultimately leads, we hope, to change in relation to their practices. The WTO processes enable and allow for third parties, for other countries, to become third parties to the processes as well. So we will welcome the participation of other nations through these processes. Uh, which will mean that this is not just a matter assessed in relation to the Australian barley industry, but hopefully can give rise to greater confidence in terms of the Chinese application of these processes to all nations into the future. Your expectation, is it your expectation that other countries might join this and it might become a broader push? It's quite commonplace for other countries to become third parties to proceedings in the WTO. Australia has done so on many occasions, China has done so on many occasions, and I would anticipate that others would do so on this occasion. The WTO has been, uh, the appellate court is now down to one judge, that's to Donald Trump, so it's usually got seven, down to one. Um, so you say it's going to take possibly years. I mean, could it take decades, given that it's been stripped of all resources and practically useless at the moment? Uh, well, Andrew, uh, you, uh, you make uh, an interesting point in that question, but, uh, but it does actually also highlight an important point in relation to uh, both Australia's and China's stated commitments to the World Trade Organisation and its processes. So there are essentially three distinct phases that, uh, that this will go through, assuming there isn't an off-ramp in which negotiation settles the issue. The first phase is the consultation phase, uh, which is a relatively limited process running over a couple of months. Uh, where the parties are essentially forced to engage in a, in a consultation, in a mediation, if you like, to see if it can be resolved without having going to the next stages. Assuming that doesn't uh, lead to an outcome, the second stage is the primary phase of considering the case, uh, where a panel is formed in the WTO uh, to consider the arguments and to ultimately form a judgment. Then there is an appeal right, which is what you're speaking of in terms of the appellate body of the WTO which is currently in a state of dysfunction. However, a number of countries, around 20, uh, worked together over the last year or so uh, to agree upon an alternate approach uh, whilst that appellate body uh, is in that state of dysfunction. Notably, Australia and China both agreed to be parties to that alternate approach. So we do have a functional appeal avenue available if we ultimately get to that stage. And we do so as a result of the fact that both Australia and China have demonstrated uh, a commitment to cooperate with the EU, with Canada and with others at the WTO in addressing uh, this vacuum that exists in relation to its appellate body. Uh, and I hope that that mutual demonstration that Australia and China have both shown to the utilisation of the WTO's processes is also underpinned and reflected in the way in which this case is conducted. And ultimately, I again appeal for the fact that just as we have done so with Canada and the wine industry, and just as many others have done so in initiating WTO processes, 
there is always the ability uh, to pause them and resolve these matters through dialogue instead. Minister, it's been confirmed that Five Eyes officials are discussing potential joint retaliatory sanctions against China in response to what it has been doing to Australia, or possibly refusing to sell certain products to China that China refuses to purchase from Australia, like coal. Where do you think that level of response fits in with something more formal like the World Trade Organization? Would that be a move that you would support from our allies, given that, by your own admission, we are potentially entering into a years-long process, whereas this could actually bring China back to the table much faster? Uh, I'll make two points there. The first is that Australia respects the proper processes, and we are engaging through the proper processes and taking this dispute to the next stage of the World Trade Organisation is just that. It is a utilisation of the proper processes that we've all signed up to in terms of settling trade disputes. The second point I'd make is that when it comes to the sales of Australian goods and obviously the disruption that occurs uh, when uh, excessive tariffs are placed as part of an anti-dumping decision, as has been the case in relation to Australia's barley exports and our wine exports to China, of course, we have to go and look for alternate markets to support those industries. Our network of trade agreements allows us to do that. Our relationships with other countries allow us to do that. Uh, and we will, of course, do everything we can and are doing everything we can within our powers uh, through our Austrade, diplomatic and other networks uh, to use those relationships to help our producers uh, find and access successfully those alternate markets. But this is retaliatory action that other large nations are considering joining in on our behalf. They're stepping up to the plate to, to help Australia. What's your take on that possibility? It's, it's for other nations to speak for themselves. I speak for Australia, and Australia is using the proper processes of the WTO and exploring wherever we can the opportunities in alternate markets using our network of trade agreements and all of our other relationships to give our producers the best possible chance of accessing those markets. Could this be the first of several cases? Are you looking at bringing similar actions on wine, coal, cotton, seafood, beef, anything else? It is, uh, it is possible that there could be further actions and, uh, and certainly I would reserve all of Australia's rights in that regard. Uh, we have uh, a series of different actions that China has taken during the course of this year, uh, and each of them come with slightly different criteria for how you might respond in the WTO. Barley and wine are obviously both using similar uh, criteria in relation to anti-dumping measures, and China's rulings and decisions on those uh, are transparent. We think they're erroneous, but they're transparent, and we've got the ability to be able to respond to those. Uh, in relation to other matters, uh, some of the trade sanctions uh, are clearer, uh, such as the use of phytosanitary or regulatory labelling and other standards. Uh, and if we don't see appropriate steps taken to be able to resolve those issues in accordance with the agreements and undertakings that we share, well, again, we could consider further action, including the potential use of the WTO. Others seem to be the application of pressure or market distorting factors within the Chinese system, where um, businesses within China, often state-owned enterprises, are being discouraged from purchasing uh, Australian goods. Uh, now, that, of course, is, uh, is a harder point to prove than where there are extensive judgments or rulings that have been made by Chinese officials behind it. And in those areas, we will monitor closely all of uh, the trends that unfold in relation to purchasing decisions, uh, watch that closely and see whether that leads us down certain avenues for appeal. How is this escalating um, trade dispute? Can you clarify what it's ultimately costing Australia in terms of a, a dollar figure or hit to our GDP? Look, the, uh, the costs obviously depend very much upon uh, just where uh, China chooses to take this. And in saying that, I emphasise Australia has not changed uh, our positions in relation uh, to our support for the growth and economic development of China, uh, to our support for a positive relationship between Australia and China and to our commitment to, uh, to it being an open trading nation. Uh, China has undertaken a number of steps this year. Uh, they come at uh, some relatively small thus far macroeconomic cost, uh, but clearly at some direct cost to some of the industry sectors and with the pressure of shifting volume into other markets uh, and whether or not that impacts upon the price points uh, in those markets. So we are continuing to monitor uh, that very closely uh, with each of those individual businesses 
Uh, it really is uh, in support of the industries, the businesses and the jobs in those sectors uh, that our priority lies. And that's why we will work as hard as we can to help them find those alternate markets and contracts wherever possible. But do you have a sort of ballpark figure so far? Look, the costs obviously affect trade volumes that are in the billions of dollars, uh, but uh, there will be alternate markets uh, for many of those, uh, those items uh, and opportunities there, which we have to continue to work through to make sure that we get uh, the best possible substitute markets at the best possible prices for those, uh, for those goods and services. Is considering this WTO process could take years or, or, or decades, how will this actually help producers or you know, Australian businesses actually caught up in this issue at the moment? Is this about drawing a line in the sand for future disputes or do you hope that actually lodging these sort of cases might hopefully you know, get China to reconsider their, their actions right now and here and now? Yeah, as I said before, we, uh, we would hope that this dispute uh, will ultimately resolve the issue in case in relation to Australian barley industry. And in the meantime, of course, Australian barley producers will um, assess whether they plant barley in future years or whether they plant other grains and crops. Um, and we will be working with them in terms of the opportunities for them to pursue avenues uh, to sell into other markets. But we also hope it provides a systemic check in relation to the way in which this decision and case has been handled by China uh, and can provide a greater certainty in the long run uh, for other sectors and ultimately perhaps other countries as well in relation to how such issues are considered and handled. Minister, you're in your final days of the trade portfolio, which I'm sure you probably believe that. Um, can you just sort of, I guess, reflect on, on, on how things have got so badly with China and in particular, I guess, the, the, the hypocrisy of them when you hear Xi Jinping give speeches and talking about free trade and, and, and keeping international commerce going, and yet here he is carrying on like a bully boy tactics, beating up on the small kid in the playground, which is what it looks like very much. Do you think the message is that China is just an unreliable business partner? Uh, well, if these are my final days in the trade portfolio, I'm not about to throw diplomacy out the door, uh, much to your disappointment in the last few days. Um, Look, we've seen, as, uh, as I've reflected through the course of the year, that the risk profile of trading and doing business with China has grown throughout the course of this year. Uh, that the fact that China has accumulated a series of decisions that look like sanctions against Australia uh, obviously changes that risk proposition for Australian businesses and industries as they choose to consider doing business with China. And it also has a knock-on effect in relation to others around the world. Australia is not the first country to see China apply different trade sanctions against them uh, that appear to lack justification if you just look at the trade elements of the relationship. Uh, and so that heightened risk profile is one that all businesses around the world potentially face, which means it's a bad outcome for China and Chinese and the Chinese economy as well as for economies like ours around the world, that ultimately China faces the prospect uh, that businesses making commercial decisions around the world will decide that there's a higher risk and potentially not worth the rewards that are there, and they will take their trade or investment avenues elsewhere. But China is also still the second largest economy in the world, the biggest consumer goods market in our region, uh, a market with a burgeoning middle class, and unsurprisingly, given that scale, is the number one trading partner for us and for most other countries within our region, the vast majority of other countries within our region. So we are right uh, to stand by our values, which includes the principles uh, of supporting China's economic prosperity, which has achieved the miracle of our lifetime in lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and improving living standards for, uh, uh, for many as a result of that. We're right to stand by that as an objective worthy of continued pursuit and worthy of Australia continuing uh, to seek to engage and support through a partnership approach. But none of that comes with a selling out of our values. None of that comes uh, with Australia compromising in relation to our national security objectives. Uh, and ultimately, uh, what is going to be required here is from Australia a period of calm, consistency and patience. Uh, and for uh, China, we hope to be willing to come to the table 
recognising that Australia is going to be consistent in all of our values, but that includes our willingness to engage with them. Uh, and we will sit down at any time uh, to re-engage at the highest levels to try to work through these issues and to make sure that our peoples and our businesses who have for a considerable period of time built a strong relationship are able to get back onto that strong footing. Is the government making representations to the incoming Biden administration to quickly accelerate the, the appointment of those WTO appellate judges so that institutions such as the WTO can get up and running better than they have been under the Trump administration? We've got uh, uh, many issues across uh, across a range of levels to uh, to talk to the Biden administration uh, about as uh, as they take office. Uh, we'll have discussions in due course about uh, about the WTO appellate body, uh, but right now uh, we're at the very early stages of uh, of a potential dispute with China. Uh, now moving into those formal consultations and then the uh, then the appointment of a panel, as I outlined before, uh, the prospect of an appeal is still quite some distance off. And as I stressed, we do, as a result of Australia and China and other countries cooperating in the WTO, have an alternate mechanism already available to us and agreed between us as to how such an appeal would be resolved. Can you say that it's consistent with its values, that it, um, it respects the uh, rules and it's transparent. But let me take you back to the Eric's question. With regards to Meng Nu Dairy, uh, attempted takeover of, um, of Lion, now, it had passed FERB. FERB had said no problem. The ACCC said there was no problem. The Treasury said there was no problem. And yet, uh, for some undeclared reason, uh, Josh Frydenberg blocked it. So aren't the Chinese right in being rather cross at, uh, at our hypocrisy? Uh, no, I don't think that's, the, that's an appropriate way to, uh, to present it, Andrew. In the end, as, uh, as I said before, uh, the vast majority of FERB applications, of foreign investment applications, including the vast majority of China's applications, uh, continue to be successful through our processes. This one out last night. Um, I, uh, I understand there may be a singling out in relation to one uh, that was one of a few that was unsuccessful versus the many that are successful. Uh, China is an important part of our foreign investment landscape, by no means the largest. Uh, our largest foreign investment is the United States, our second largest is the United Kingdom, our third largest is Japan, uh, the European Union uh, being essentially our fourth largest collectively without the, uh, the UK as part of that mix. So we do see uh, that China, I think, comes in at about number six. Uh, but in all of those cases, uh, the vast majority of applications are accepted. Uh, and Australia continues to emphasise that we are open and welcoming to foreign investment where it passes the national interest test. And we've demonstrated that by saying yes in the vast majority of cases. Thanks, everyone.